Um, thanks, Patrick. Um, I, I will say, and uh, and I know Pete will reflect this, that um, that our our belief that um, that like arthroscopy and external fixator and screws and plates, that this is a tool, but we're finding more and more it's a, it's a really valuable tool in both forefoot and hindfoot surgery. And, um, and kind of the big splash, um, in my opinion, is Halix valgus surgery. And, um, and Pete's been a super early adopter, very active in, um, in the minimal invasive societies that have uh, championed these techniques. And so uh, Peter and I have both uh, been practicing in North Carolina for over 20 years together and have known each other well and have become good friends. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm really excited to introduce Pete Mangone uh, to give us a, a start on, um, on the Mika technique. And then afterwards, I'll present some cases, answer questions, and we'll try to end uh, right about the one hour mark. Uh, so, Pete. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Hodges. I appreciate it. I um, let me get my uh, screen here and I'll pull it up. I appreciate the opportunity before I pull up the talk, and and I want to reiterate that uh, what Patrick said as well. Uh, I think that we are a little bit late to the ball game, and I think uh, part of that is for uh, reasons uh, that we had nothing to do with 20 and 30 years ago. But uh, I think. The good news is the techniques have evolved, and I think we're at a point where many of us, now that we are more technically skilled in arthroscopy and other uh, techniques, that we can do these minimally invasive procedures safely and effectively. So uh, with that in mind, let me share my screen here, and I will uh, pull it up. Let's just do the desktop, and I'll pull up my talk here. All right, can everybody see that okay? All right, so, so we're gonna go over how to perform the uh, ProStep Mica Bunyan procedure. We'll go over a little bit about uh, the technique itself, but also the indications, what it can do, what it can't do, show a little bit of uh, case study information, and then uh, from there, we'll be able to answer some questions uh, as far as anything that comes up and topics. And by all means, if uh, we need to interrupt to ask questions, by uh, all means, go ahead and do so, Hodges. So, you know, obviously we're doing this with uh, Wright Medical in mind. Uh, they're helping to sponsor, and I have to give kudos to Wright Medical. I think they were on the front end of this. Uh, they could see this coming and uh, uh, solicited myself and some others to be involved in this process of bringing this to the states. And it really has been a tremendous adjunct to my practice. Uh, and I think it's only going to expand in the roles. It, we started off just with kind of the Bunyan idea, but it, it's expanded into many areas of my practice. So what are the goals of uh, ProStep Michael? I think it's important to understand that the goals of, of the procedure and the use of the ProStep devices are essentially the same as open surgery. What we're trying to do is decrease patient's pain we're trying to decrease their deformity, and we're trying to improve their function. So just because it's done in a minimally invasive manner doesn't change what we're trying to do here. And so, you know, it's just a matter of how we go about doing it. Can we do it in a friendlier and nicer way to the body than we otherwise have been doing for a long time? And we know, you know, looking at procedures in the knee and the shoulder, that, uh, and the work that we've done in the ankle, that if we can do things through smaller incisions for arthroscopy, that in many cases, we can have patients have less pain and allow them to function at a higher level closer uh, to the time of surgery. So what are the indications? Well, the good news is that the indications for the procedure itself, for the, the mica bunion correction, is essentially very similar to the regular indications for an open distal osteotomy. It does uh, uh, allow even maybe for more deformity correction, and we can talk about that in the discussion, uh, but in general, the same concept applies, and that is a symptomatic hallux valgus patient that's failed appropriate non-operative management. So this includes patients that have an increased uh, hallux valgus angle, an increased IM angle, increased hallux interphalangeus can be approached this way, and then even just an enlarged bump can be approached in this manner. So anything, any patient that has a, a, a traditional bunion that you might be thinking would be a candidate for an open uh, a distal type procedure is certainly a candidate for a minimally invasive procedure. <clears throat> so what can the procedure do? And I think we can talk about what it can and can't do. 
Well, certainly it can use smaller incisions and, and allow us to correct the deformity through smaller incisions, which potentially opens up some opportunities for patients with less vascular uh, uh, continuity and or poorer skin quality. Not that those patients are the usual patient that's around, but certainly an elderly patient with poor skin tissue quality might benefit from an exostosis type procedure or even a, a minimally invasive Aiken type procedure to take pressure off of their toe, uh, off their second toe if they're getting an ulcer, whereas doing an open procedure would carry with it a much higher risk of potential wound complications. It reduces the patient's perception of pain. Pain is subjective, every patient is different, but I can tell you that my patients in general have far, far less pain than they had previously. Most of my patients that come in for bunion procedures have said, you know, I, I haven't gotten this done or I, I, I was gonna get this done 10 years ago, but I've heard terrible things about bunion surgery. I've been told it hurts, that you're worse than childbirth. And so I never was gonna have this done. And so this allows patients to have a much more pleasant surgical experience uh, than what otherwise we've been able to do. And then certainly, as I tell pay, uh, people when I talk is, you know, we do not do or nor do I endorse cosmetic procedures for the foot. However, I will say that without a doubt, we as foot and ankle surgeons are judged on the cosmetic appearance of the foot. How does the foot look? What's the swelling like? What are the incisions like? And clearly patients go out, talk to their friends, talk to their family, and that becomes a source of referrals or non-referrals when you're talking about patients coming into the office. So it's not a cosmetic procedure, it's a procedure done for decreased pain and, to, and for deformity, deformity correction. However, the cosmetic result is substantially better than what we usually see with a larger type incision. And so you can see these small incisions, basically four to five small incisions that we use for the procedure. So I've seen definite decreased post-operative pain, which has obviously been increasingly important with a re recent focus on, uh, on opioid abuse. There have been multiple studies that have been published in the last uh, year to year and a half that have also shown that uh, patients who have minimally invasive or percutaneous surgery in their foot for bunions use less opioids than they would use if they had open surgery. I've had decreased post-operative incisional issues. So when performed properly, and you do need to use proper technique, this decreases the risk of wound dehiscence and infection and improve cosmetic appearance. Though you still do get some swelling because it takes a little bit of time for the bone to heal, it overall, the, the appearance of the foot remains uh, much better. So what can it not do? And I think, you know, I'm a, I'm a golfer and I don't play as much as I used to, but one of the key questions if you're a pretty good golfer is not where do I hit the ball when you're trying to hit the ball in the green, but where should I miss if I'm gonna miss? And, and I think that's important when you talk about, uh, when you talk about doing surgeries, right? You also need to know what can this procedure not do because you certainly do not want to try to attempt the procedure and try to utilize this tool in a way that's not gonna be effective. Otherwise, you won't have a good result and the patient won't have a good result. So it doesn't compensate for poor preoperative decision-making, right? If you've got a patient who's not a good surgical candidate, they're not a good surgical candidate, whether it's MIS or, or open. It cannot compensate for poor intraoperative technique, and I would argue that it actually punishes you for poor intraoperative technique, much more so than open procedures. You have to follow the procedures. You have to follow the way things are done. There are people who have been doing this for a while, and if you're going to freelance, this is not the place to do it in, especially early on in your experience. And, it, and you, I cannot, it cannot promise you a quick and easy transition where you're going to jump in and after two or three cases be able to do this without practice. It takes time to practice this like any tool, just like arthroscopy does. And however, once you get it down, once you learn how to do it, it becomes just as routine as your arth arthroscopic procedures become. And I can't think of, of myself doing some procedures now open that I do percutaneously because I just think that, you know, I, I don't even need to do them open anymore. So remember, if you, use the, if you have the wrong patient with the wrong indications and the wrong operation, you're gonna have a poor outcome, no matter what tool you use. And you have to be aware because sometimes the ProStep MICA procedure, you know, patients hear about it, they wanna come in, they've heard about these smaller incisions, it can sometimes bring patients with unrealistic expectations. So you have to make sure you counsel patients appropriately. Um, as far as what they can expect. And yes, it is a good surgery and it works well, but at the same time, it's not a magic wand. It doesn't make people better tomorrow. They do still have to go through a, a healing process. 
So what exactly is the, the mica or mica? It's a minimally invasive Chevron Aiken. Uh, and you know, we know what Chevron and Aikens are in terms of our, our corrective tools in the operating room open, and it's just doing it minimally invasive. So what are the specific benefits of this for the bunion procedures? Well, number one, this is an extra capsular osteotomy. And I think that's important because one of the reasons I started to look at this procedure was not because I was, you know, uh, I, I couldn't get a bunion corrected or I couldn't get my hallux valgus corrected open. Uh, it was because I started to see patients back, some of which who had some arthritic changes in their joints after, you know, 10, 12, 15 years. That's the benefits of being in one place for 21 years is, you know, benefits and curses. You do get to see some of your results back long term. And so I noticed that some of these patients that I did a bunion correction may very well have had a great bunion correction and for 10 or 12 years did terrific, but then started to develop some arthritic changes. And I, I wondered, well, why was that? And you know, I kept coming back to the fact, well, I'm really tightening this capsule. And we know that in the shoulder, if you over tighten the capsule, in the knee, if you over tighten the knee, you end up getting arthritic changes. And so I thought, well, maybe this is what's going on when I over tighten these capsules to kind of get this repair. So as I uh, started looking, I realized this is an extra capsular osteotomy, which allows the head and the capsule to shift as one. And this is why you can also get rotational correction with this, because you actually are shifting the entire uh, distal uh, uh, sling, uh, ligamentous, and capsular complex together when you make your correction. You really don't have any significant capsular tightening going on, and it allows for earlier return to full weight bearing. And although it does swell for a little while, I've found that patients actually return to function better, obviously, if we get them moving faster uh, in, in, uh, in that. So what are, we, what are the tools that we use? Well, the power control unit, I think, is important. I think the tools that Wright Medical use, the power control unit is a, um, a system that has significantly less thermal uh, generation than the other systems on the market. Um, it's a, a low speed, high torque system that I think has been shown in studies to have 70% less thermal heat uh, generation than with, uh, uh, with competitors units. And, and I think that's important because if you burn the bone, you're gonna potentially result in non-unions, skin complications. This is specific to foot and ankle surgery. Um, you should set it into 6,000 RPMs. Uh, you have to balance between cutting and heat generation because there still is some thermal heat generation, just like when you use a saw or a drill. And basically, there's a technique to that in which you can shuttle your hand, you vary the speed of the drill so that um, it doesn't create as much heat. And then there's a saline irrigation cooling system that's used to basically uh, uh, try to absorb some of that heat. I actually have my physician assistant also irrigate the area at the same time. And so she is doing that consistently to try to keep from burning the skin. Um, the, the rafts and the translators, so you've got both cutting burrs and wedge burrs. The cutting burrs are the burrs that we use mostly for uh, the osteotomies. The wedge burrs we use to contour or take off exostosis. And then you have the translator devices that are used along with the uh, osteotomes and, uh, and the uh, uh, elevators to allow us to move the uh, bones where we want them and hold them there. So some pearls you know, about the learning curve. So uh, a couple of general hints that I tell people whenever they start. The first thing is use the C-arm frequently. It requires a while for you to truly understand the anatomy. I, I know all of us who are foot and ankle surgeons, we, we understand that anatomy very well, but at the same time, it takes some time to really get the, the contour of the foot and, and not everybody's foot is the same. Some feet are bigger, some feet are smaller. You've got metatarsus adductus, you have you know, other patients who have a, a more flexible foot. So given that, the, the landmarks are a little bit different. And so I don't think you can overuse the C-arm initially. Number two, uh, you really should draw out the bony landmarks. And again, although you may think you know the anatomy really well, the reality is you're used to doing open surgery. And when you're doing the open surgery, you can see it. And that obviously helps with the placement of devices. When you're doing it percutaneously, it now that little tiny five degree change becomes a big change uh, three centimeters later in the metatarsal head. So, uh, so draw out the bony long landmarks. So as you use the device, you have to rotate your hand and pull at the same time to avoid leveraging on the skin. You can't just move the device up and down because your incision is just a, a poke hole. You actually have to use, I call it the ice cream scope, scoop kind of maneuver like this 
where you, you supinate and pull at the same time to generate the, uh, the, the cutting. And then, you, as you said, you vary your speeds to minimize the thermal generation uh, so that basically you don't have as, as frequent, you, don't, you just don't turn it on high speed and go full tilt. Uh, it's not like putting a, a drill uh, for a screw in. You wanna vary your speeds and kind of tease the bone a little bit as you cut it. So we're gonna go over the, an overview of the procedure. We're gonna talk about the room setup. We're gonna talk about the initial K-wire um, fixation and distal osteotomy. We're gonna talk about moving the head, uh, uh, fragment translating, uh, pulling into varus and rotating. It's kind of a three-dimensional maneuver. And then um, we'll talk about uh, uh, advancing it into the metatarsal head, placing the second K-wire, measuring the length. You drill over the first K-wire, place the first screw, drill over the second K-wire, and place the second screw. So it's kind of a, a systematic approach. And, and as I've said, you know, the Joel Venois and David Redfern, they've made all the mistakes. They've gone through the trials themselves. There's an old saying that a smart man learns from his or her mistakes, and a wise person uh, learns from others' mistakes. So my advice would be to learn from others and do it the way that they've designed, because it works very well that way. And then, of course, there's the Aiken component where we're going to place the wire initially, make an oblique osteotomy, advance the K-wire, um, and then drill over that and place the screw. And then, finally, it's very important that you, that you strap the toe and, and to hold the correction and, and, and hold the soft tissues where you want them to be. So a couple things, and we'll show a picture in a second, is assuming a right-hand surgeon, if you're a left-hand surgeon, everything from this is going to be the mirror image. So for a right-hand surgeon, the mini C-arm is always on the right side of the patient. Even when you're operating on the left foot, the, the, the C-arm is on the right side. Um, you need the foot pedal in reach, obviously. Usually you're gonna need a, either a mini C-arm or regular C-arm, and you're gonna need the foot pedal for the C-arm. The power box is on the left side near the head of the bed. You bring the foot pedal down near the surgeon, obviously. The operative leg is either extended off the end of the bed or elevated up on some sort of block so that you can gain access and have three-dimensional access to the foot to be able to move the uh, C-arm around. And then the scrub nurse should be located at the end of the table, usually to one side or the other, depending on which side of the body you're, you're operating on. So you can see here on this particular circumstance, the C-arm is always on the, the, the right side. I'm a right-handed uh, surgeon, so it's coming in from the right side. Uh, here, that gives me room to operate on this side. If it's the left foot, it would be the same way because I have to stand and kind of operate over the top of the foot. You can't stand in the patient's groin to do their surgery. It does take some time to get used to this, though, because we're used to having the C-arm oftentimes, except in, in ankle fractures, come in potentially from, if you're doing a right-sided bunion, it might come in from this side, but a left-side bunion for me, if I was operating traditionally open, would come in from the left side of the table. So it takes a little bit of, of uh, um, learning curve to, to figure that out and get set up correctly. Um, and you can see here's David um, Redfern doing his, coming in, doing a left foot, operating from the top of the foot over into the area, and the C-arm coming in from, the, uh, from the, the right side of the table, okay? So that's kind of the technique for the setup and how that functions. So what's the technique? Well, the technique is first to proceed with uh, the bone, uh, uh, the distal osteotomy. So first you make a small incision, you wanna make it inferior to the uh, dorsal medial cutaneous nerve, and you're going to make that incision with just a poke hole, make uh, and clear away a little bit of the soft tissues, and then enter your burr. The burr goes straight in, you can you know, initiate it, and you, go, you plunge straight in. And at that point, I, um, I've already looked at the C-arm to make sure I'm in the correct location for the osteotomy. Uh, just like this shows over here, I want to make sure I'm in this kind of right at the nook of where the, uh, the metaphyseal diaphyseal junction is located. Uh, very similar to I tell people, or most orthopedists know kind of where you put a distal femoral traction pin. It's kind of on that, that flare, just, just before the flare or just at the flare of the femoral head. It's similar as to where you're going to put your osteotomy for your first metatarsal head. And so you're gonna drill the hole from slightly dorsal and medial to plantar and lateral. And we'll show this in an in a, um, uh, axial view in a second. The first cut, you then rotate your hand up and you're gonna make a dorsal uh, cut that's relatively short and nearly vertical. And the second cut is gonna be plantar with a, a slight chevron type cut 
um, that allows you to get a, a little bit of a chevron component as opposed to a, a straight transverse cut, which does not have as much stability. And then you're gonna translate the metatarsal head uh, laterally using the translators. There's very different, various different devices you can use. So with that, um, at, sometimes I'll place a K wire initially to make sure I'm in the right location for my osteotomy. But one of the things that you can do to verify your correct position on your, your K wire is just looking at where this hits the cortex. As you learn, as you get better to, to know where you are in the plane of axis, if I hit right on the lateral aspect of, the, uh, of the, the shaft right here, and I know that I'm on the lateral aspect of the cortex, if it projects short of that lateral cortex, then I know that I'm not, I'm not in the center of the bone at that point, right? I'm hitting the inferior or superior curve arc of the metatarsal. And so, you know, when you're looking down, that's one clue you can use when you place your K-wires to know for sure if you're in that uh, center cortex uh, region. Of course, you, you should always get a lateral to look at that, but that's kind of a way to look at that. And then, you know, so you're going to make your osteotomy, as I said, with this kind of short dorsal limb and then a little bit of a horizontal longer limb. And that can vary some a little bit more, some a little bit less, but traditionally we don't want to go purely vertical in that regard. Um, you're going to use the two by 20 Shannon Burr. And uh, you know, again, the angle of what you choose depend on, depends on how much stability you want. The more stability you get, the more you can, the, 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 or the more stability you want, the more horizontal the surface uh, that you want to create. And then you make that cut, as we said, from kind of dorsal medial to plantar lateral. And what that allows us to do is the edge of the uh, cut, as you rotate inferiorly, spans the whole gap of the, uh, of the metatarsal. If you go straight across, then you're liable to come across this way and not get this, this posterior inferior corner of the metatarsal. So you don't want to go straight across this way. You want to really come in at this slight angle. That allows you to sweep that way and get everything. And you're going to make that osteotomy right at that flare like we talked about, right across the flare of the first metatarsal in that region. Now, a lot of times patients will say, well, you know, can you shorten or lengthen? And there, you, you do have to make sure you're careful with your cuts because you can lengthen uh, and or shorten depending on the direction of your cut. And so remember, we're translating this over. So if you move your hand from a more, and obviously this is not where we'd make our cut, but this is just a perpendicular line to the first metatarsal. If you make your cut in a more oblique fashion from distal to proximal, then as this slides over, this will shorten the distance of the first ray, okay? And so you have to be careful. You don't want to do that. There are times where you can sometimes lengthen it. And so again, this is where if we made the cut this way, it would lengthen that way. That's a little bit, you know, that's a high obliquity. You wouldn't want to do that, but it's to, to show the point of you can lengthen this while you're doing the osteotomy. It is not, does not automatically shorten things just because you use the burr and you have a two millimeter um, wedge in that area. So, you know, traditionally, I just go, you know, across basically perpendicular to the, uh, to the axis of the first ray. I think that gives me the most consistent correction. And again, going back to the golf analogy uh, that I, I talk to people about is, you know, there's, especially when you're first starting, you know, people talk about, well, I can hit a draw or I can hit a slice. And I tell people, you know, how about just hit the ball straight first? When you can hit the ball straight consistently in golf, then you can start talking about doing funny things like making draws and, and slices and things of that nature. You know, same thing here, just make your osteotomy straight first, work on getting that, good at that. And then once you're good at that, you can start working on the nuances. So we make our cut, like we said, in that, in that oblique position, we're gonna sweep upward with your hand. And this is where we talk about that axis of rotation here and using that uh, uh, scoop, ice scoop kind of technique and you're gonna rotate on that pivot point to make your cut, while at the same time you're pulling upward and leveraging uh, against the bone, because you've gotta create some tension uh, and pressure against the bone to have it cut. So you can see here where we've made the cut, you know, uh, that short chevron osteotomy, you can see the, uh, the, the rotation of the hand here and the small percutaneous osteotomy that's done. And then you're gonna translate the metatarsal head and you're gonna translate that. And there's different ways to use it. You can use the translator that's in the kit. You can use, if you wanna do a maximum translation such as this, which is obviously a high angle trans, you know, a 100% displacement translation. You, you can do that with one of these elevators 
or you can use a freer uh, or uh, even uh, sometimes even a K wire. But typically, I like to use this device. I think it works well. It keeps the head centered and allows you to keep the head from floating into plantar and dorsiflexion. And, and you know, this is kind of the maneuver uh, we'll, we'll talk about. This is Dr. Redfern and, and how he does it. But it's basically what you're doing is you're pushing the, the head, translating the head to the lateral side. At the same time, you're pulling the first metatarsal out of varus, or I'm sorry, out of valgus toward varus. And that tilts the metatarsal head back. And then you're derotating the toe at the same time. So it's really a three-dimensional maneuver that's being performed. And so again, you're, you're, you're pushing the first metatarsal head over. Oftentimes, you need to displace it further than you think. Uh, uh, many times when I first started, I would undercorrect because I was afraid if I translated too far over, it wouldn't be stable, but it's plenty stable. So, you know, be aggressive with your translation. The other thing that we do when we're pulling in that direction is while you're pulling, while you're pushing the first metatarsal head this direction, you're also pulling the first ray outward. And, and really what that's doing is taking the slack out of the first metatar out of the first tarsal metatarsal joint. So you're essentially stretching the first tarsal metatarsal joint to its maximum IM angle. And, in, in, and by doing that, you're essentially, uh, by taking the slack out of that, you're removing some of that uh, potential uh, first TMT instability that could result, that could translate backward. If you pull the first ray out as far as it'll go, and then you push the first metatarsal head over, you essentially will get a full correction of your deformity. And then you rotate the head at, out of pronation into a, a supinated position and, and holding the finger, holding the, the metatarsal upward. So, so that's really the key maneuver as you do this. And you, you, know, you can see the pressure, it's, uh, it's pushing this over the metatarsal head. Here's the K wire and the, and the metatarsal head is staying in line with where the K wire is. Um, and, and so then you place your first K wire. Your first K wire is placed in there and it's, it's bicortical. This cortex, that cortex, if you could start it even a little bit more proximal, that's ideal. And I want you to take note of how the sesamoids are reduced and they are centered on the metatarsal head because you're holding that rotational component. I actually continue to hold that rotational component until I even place my second K wire. And I place the second K wire, I try to get it about a centimeter to 12 millimeters distal. And I try to just skirt the edge of this cortex right here and kind of fire it in there. If you can get them parallel, that's great. Sometimes they're not exactly parallel. You just don't want them, you know, converging on one point because obviously you can't get fixation as well with two places, two, two of the spots in the, or two screws in the same place. And I happen to use the larger K wire. I find it easier to use the larger K wire initially to, to get my fixation on the head. I'll use a smaller screw and exchange that out uh, at the end. So there, so there's the, you've got your two K wires in place. You're going to check a lateral view and make sure that they're also in the center of the shaft, um, which I don't show here and I apologize. Uh, and, and, but then here you go, here's your correction. And this is the big question everybody always asks me is, well, can you get the sesamoids? You know, how can you get the sesamoids? And so I have multiple CT scans of patients like this where we have weight bearing CT scans post-op and you can see those sesamoids are right underneath the head. Whereas over here, they were not, there and why is that? Well, the reason for that is because we don't detach the sesamoids from the, the metatarsal head. You're not detaching the sesamoids when you do your osteotomy right here. You're taking this entire ligama, bony ligamentous complex and you're shifting the entire thing over. And so the sesamoid first metatarsal head relationship doesn't change. And when you derotate that and fix it in that position, that allows you to get your sesamoid correction. As a matter of fact, I oftentimes will use my sesamoid position to identify if I've translated over far enough. If I haven't translated over far enough, typically my sesamoids are not fully reduced. And so that, that tells me, okay, back up for a second. You need to kind of push the head over just a little bit further. Even if I think I'm over far enough, the, the body's telling you it's, you're not over far enough because you haven't derotated the head enough. Uh, and, and translated the head enough to get the forces back to where they should be. Um, and so here, and so there's the big K wire. You can see where the second smaller K wire is in there. And, and I usually exchange that out after the second, uh, uh, after the first screws in. And then we can see where we place the screws parallel. And again, you see the sesamoids well centered underneath the first metatarsal head. And then you basically take off this bump. But it is important that this first screw engage all 
the, both of these cortices because that's the screw that holds the correction, okay? And that's the screw that, that basically is giving you the stability you need in the uh, plantar dorsal plane. This screw is giving you rotational stability to, to prevent it from rotating on one point of fixation. But this, by having it, this engaged on this cortex and this cortex, that gives you stability of the construct in the dorsal plantar uh, plane. Um, it's very stiff, it works fantastic, um, and, and oftentimes, uh, you know, it, the bite is, is phenomenal on these screws. So uh, I happened to uh, uh, put the K-wire through the skin and then I, before I drill, so once I have the lengths, then I put the K-wire through the plantar skin, I grab it with a, uh, um, a hemostat, and then I drill and place my screw, uh, and that way the, the K-wire doesn't pull out while you're in there. That I recommend using two screws. I know there are some people out there that are only using one, but I think that just you know, potentially results in a, a problem with fixation. Like I said, these are specifically designed for this procedure. They've got a chamfered head. They have excellent fixation. Um, I frankly use them in other, other areas of the body or other areas of the foot as well for fixation. They allow, they're fully threaded, which, which allows for a fix, stability fixation on all those cortices but at the same time has a, a differential thread pitch, which allows for compression. So now, you, so you've, now you've done your, your uh, uh, first metatarsal osteotomy, your chevron component, you fix it, now you move on to the Aiken, and you're gonna use a, a two by 12 millimeter burr. Again, you're gonna use the C-arm frequently. You're gonna go slow with the burr. I personally like to set my pin in the proximal phalanx first because it allows me to make sure it's centered. And then I perform an oblique osteotomy, though you can certainly perform a, a transverse one if you'd like. And I happen to penetrate the plantar lateral cortex first and sweep down, and then I go up plantar dorsal lateral surface on the, on the dorsal side and go up. The key is you wanna leave a hinge, right? You don't wanna go through the outside cortex fully. You, you wanna leave a hinge so that you can just close this down. And the beauty of this is as you learn how to use this procedure, essentially, as you go in, you make your cuts, you can actually continue to increase your IM angle correction, essentially by closing this wedge down uh, or closing this metatarsal down uh, or phalanx, I'm sorry, phalanx down on the burr while you run the burr at slow speed. And you can essentially control how big of a closing wedge osteotomy you want to make. Uh, and, and that allows you to bring it to the correction you want, you fire your K-wire, and then you place your screw. So, you know, it's, it's a pencil grip that you use for this. Let's see if that's a video on this one, no. Um, and, and so, uh, and you can see where I'm, I'm using the fluoro shot and I'm in here holding the toe and I'm essentially pulling the toe into a little bit of varus while I use the burr, which allows me to create my, uh, my you know, the exact amount of correction that I want. And I can kind of almost, uh, you know, titrate, and I realize that's a chemistry term, but titrate the amount of correction I want by gently taking a little bit more, more bone, a little bit more bone, and just closing the osteotomy down on, the, uh, on the, the burr. And then, of course, the strapping is extremely important. So after you get done placing your fixation, at that point, uh, if you've done lesser toe work, you, you add that in, but the strapping is highly important. To, to hold the toe in the corrected position and derotate that pronation. So this is what I do. Uh, I use a, a, a moistened gauze followed by uh, uh, some cast padding. And then I use the uh, Coban to kind of hold that correction both in varus and, the, and, and, uh, and supinate that toe to get it out of pronation. And this has worked very well for me. Uh, and then we can allow the patients to walk uh, very quickly afterwards. So I, I actually will let them uh, put a little bit of, uh, of weight on it first. And you know, I used to keep them off. And when I first started the procedure, I was you know, gun shy. And I'd be like, oh, stay off this for, for two weeks. Don't put any weight on it. But what I've learned is that people can put weight on it. And if you put them in that compressive dressing, the swelling actually does fine. Uh, you just can't let them act normal, right? They can't go out and live a normal life. But they can actually put weight on this. Um, you certainly don't want them pushing off and jumping. Um, but, but the fixation is completely solid. I usually keep them in an orthopedic post-op shoe for six weeks and then allow them to transition to a regular shoe as they feel comfortable. I personally, I keep them in a strap dressing for the first two weeks. I bring them back to the office. I re-strap them and then I put them uh, in for another two weeks in the strapping, allowing them to wait there. 
There are some people who will use a foam spacer between the first and second toes. I just found that that strapping for that extra two weeks really helps to settle the soft tissues down, keeps the swelling down further, and actually allows the patients to get back into a regular shoe faster. Um, and definitely, obviously, elevating for the first couple of weeks. So this is a video, we're gonna skip past this because if we need to go through it, we can, but it's an extended video. And I'm just gonna show you a case example and then we'll move on to uh, questions. So you know, this is a young lady who came to see me specifically for the procedure. She came in and said, I want you to do this procedure, Dr. Van Gogh, and I've read about it and I understand you're doing it. So you can see an increased IM angle, uh, a fairly big bunion eminence. She had never had anything done. So we went in and I did her, uh, her osteotomy. Uh, we did her, uh, uh, you know, these are some of the photos I've shown you, placed the screws. Um, you know, as you know, as you can notice, I did not remove any of the bump, right? Because when you translate this head over far enough, the bump doesn't need to be removed in 95% of the cases. Um, you just need to re remove a little bit of the overhanging bone right in this area. And so here she was at her first week post-op visit. And I did this in, I think, the, the first week in November is when I did her, her first surgery. So she looked pretty good. I then saw her back after I fixed her, her uh, other her side. She came back in February and I did her other side. And so I'll show you kind of both as we go along. So here she was, I did her right side, which was three weeks post-op. Her, her left side was 10 weeks post-op, um, which I, I would have struggled to do, honestly, in patients previously. In my experience, I, you know, patients, if they were less than 12 to 16 weeks out after an open bunion, they just struggled to be able to weight bear fully on that foot and feel comfortable. So again, here she is at, at three weeks on the right, 10 weeks on the left. The swelling's not too bad uh, you know, on both sides. She had minimal pain, she was very happy, and she went on you know, to heal just fine with her, her correction. There she is at three weeks, and you can see the bone formation here that's occurring in this area and in this area that occurs across these osteotomies. Right? So it takes about four to six months to see that, but they do heal across that area with, uh, just like if you fractured, if that, if that uh, metatarsal was in a, uh, a car accident and fractured, it would heal with, uh, with callus. So, so here she was at this visit when she came to see me at this point in time, and then she came to see me at eight weeks post-op, and she says to me, well, can I tell you what I did? And I said, well, what are you talking about? And she said, well, you know, she said, this is a busy slide, but it basically says that she was afraid to have bunion surgery for a long, long time because it hurt a lot, and her, and her, her mom and her grandmother had bad feet, and she had always been told it would hurt like crazy. And so um, she said she had her first surgery on November 10th and she cooked a full Thanksgiving dinner. That wasn't what I recommended. And then she went sledding and dog walking four weeks post-op in eight inches of snow. She then had her second surgery on February 9th and returned to week, week, work one week after that, stopped using crutches at four weeks. And at eight weeks, she went up Mount Macant, which is the 13.2 mile hike up to the top of the mountain. And so, you know, here she was after the first surgery and here she was after the second surgery. Now, certainly that's not something I'd recommend that everybody do uh, with each of their patients, but I think it points to the power of this procedure and that it can be done. That, there's no way if I would have done a, a, a previous type of, you know, larger opening surgery that people would have even been able to get a shoe on comfortably at that point in time. And so... Here she was at eight weeks post-op. And so, you know, she said, you know, I'm not sure if it's the minimally invasive procedure. I would say a lot of it was. Uh, uh, better meds or the skill of, of my orthopedic surgeon, you know, obviously there's some component to that, but I think it's really about the fact that this ProStep MIS allows us as orthopedic surgeons to provide better care for our patients. And so never in her wildest dreams would she imagine that it would be so easy with minimal pain. I mean, and that's really what patients come back and say to me. Uh, on a routine basis. So, uh, so that's kind of the, 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 the technique. Obviously, as we talked about with the learning curve, there's a lot of the learning curve that goes uh, along with, I'm gonna stop my sharing for right now. There's a lot of the, of the learning curve that's involved and it's, I think, absolutely critical that those who are interested in doing this procedure uh, Take the time to practice. You've got to go to a cadaver course. You have to learn how to use these tools. Uh, you cannot practice on your patients to start off with. You won't have good results. Um, and so I think it's critical to do that, and especially this procedure. It takes two or three times doing it on a cadaver to really get a sense as to where you are. 
And then when you're doing this, when you first start doing it in your practice, make sure that you don't schedule this as your first case of 10 in a day. Okay, because you have to learn how to you know, work the OR, do things. It takes a little bit longer initially, like most minimally invasive surgical procedures do. You know, I remember when I was in practice, Hodges probably remembers too, when I was in residency, when they started doing laparoscopic cholecystectomies, and it would take like three and a half hours for them to do a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, and the, and the, uh, uh, the, the, the nurses would be in the back going, oh, my, why, why, is it, why are we doing this? Why don't we just do it open? And now they do them in 20 minutes, right? So the same thing goes true with this. It, it will take you a little bit longer initially. You have to be patient. It will pay off in the end. But just you know, go through that learning curve. Give yourself the opportunity to practice, to get better at certain sections. Then you'll, you know, you'll kind of waver back and forth. But I, I can't impress upon you how much this has uh, helped my patients and how much I think it can help your patients as well. All right, Pete, we've got a couple of key questions. The first uh, was, was on lateral releases. We had two or three questions on that. Right. Um, the, when, when I was taught, um, I was taught to do the lateral release after you've completed the metatarsal osteotomy. If, they're, if the sesamoids are a little delayed coming back and to do it percutaneously. And, and even I've, I've heard of releasing the, 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 um, the lateral head of the, of the flexor brevis. Right. Um, what, is, what is your approach to lateral release? when and how so when i first started doing this i did more lateral releases and i would do it exactly as you said i would do it after i translated the metatarsal head and i would be like oh maybe i you know it feels a little tight i need to get a better correction uh, i need to release a little bit and i would do either or both of those whether it just release the lateral capsule or uh or release a little bit of the brevis uh you know and just kind of lengthen if you will the lateral sesamoid complex just a little bit what I've found is as I get got better and better at the procedure is I, I probably do lateral release less than 3% of the time at this point. And that's kind of when I first started, that's what Joel and David said too. They were like, oh, I, I never do, I hardly ever do a lateral release. And I was like, I don't know how they can do that because it still feels tight. And what I've learned is really when, when that lateral release is necessary, what it really means is you didn't get the head over far enough and you didn't translate it over far enough to, to decompress and derotate uh, the, the uh, whole joint capsular complex. And so as you get more comfortable translating it over far enough, I've found that I don't need the lateral release anymore. And so I rarely, if ever, do it because with my head being translated over far enough, the, the, the soft tissues are more than compliant uh, because now they're oriented properly. Whereas if they're still rotated into a lateral uh, sublux position, uh, then the, the soft tissues will be too tight. Um, second question. Uh, my, that's been my experience also. I have done it a few times, but I haven't done it in a while. Um, if, if you translate the capital fragment 100% or 90%, um, how, does it heal any slower or is the, is the healing as quickly as, um, as you described in the ones you showed? Uh, I found that symptomatically they are just like the ones that I see. You know, that if you get the two cortices on that screw like you're supposed to and you get, and you get the, the proper orientation, that that is a rock solid stable construct and so the patients feel fine. The bone, the bone formation may take a little bit longer in that, that uh, triangular zone uh, on the lateral side of the, uh, of the first metatarsal shaft, may take a little longer to fill in because it's just a larger space to fill in. It's almost like a, you get a, a, a big, long, oblique fifth metatarsal fracture, and it takes a while for the, the callus to form in that area, but you see that patient back at six or eight weeks, and they have no pain, right? So there's a whole bunch of soft callus in there. It's just not cal It's just not uh, um, mineralized yet with calcium. And so you may see the x-rays may take a while to fill in, but, but clinically they do great and have you know, minimal discomfort. All right. There are a couple of questions about uh, the residual edge, the residual medial edge on the osteotomy. Um, so, 
So when I, the way I do it is to come from below and use the cutting burr to cut it off. And then sometimes it's loose enough to pull it out, but often you then use the wedge burr to clean it up. Uh, one, two, how, is that the way you still do it? Secondly, um, I've heard of some burning and is that a, a concern? And then finally, if you get skin burning, what do you do? So, okay, so going to the, the overhang. So the overhang, I, I kind of, it, for me, it depends on who I'm in doing the procedure on. And what I've found is that in my hands, uh, a, a, a little bit older patient, bone is a little bit softer. I find that using the cutting burr works, works well. Uh, and you can go in either, like you said, from dorsal, you can go in from proximal and go, uh, and go plantar. I'm sorry, plantar on the first uh, metatarsal kind of sweep upward and basically take that triangular piece off with a cutting burr and then just actually, I usually just push it into the osteotomy. You can actually just push it in and it'll just tuck itself right in that little spot. Uh, and you don't have to worry about trying to fish it out of that area. Um, however, in a younger patient with a little harder bone, sometimes I have, uh, I'll, I'll use the wedge burr, but that, but the big key is like you were saying is you have to, you can't just turn it on full speed and just go and because you will generate heat. So a lot of the irrigation and I just kind of go slow and just kind of tease it, you know, tease the, the, uh, the, the exostosis and just kind of take it down. Um, and, and kind of uh, grind it off, if you will. And that's, and I've found in some of my younger patients, I do that because sometimes I find that the cutting burr, I have trouble getting, that cortex can be pretty thick. And sometimes I have trouble getting that cutting burr to really get through that, that cortex on the medial side well enough. Um, so, so I've used both techniques. I think both techniques are useful. As far as the skin, you know, the thermal necrosis, I think the big key with that is with the, obviously using irrigation is, is, is key, but the other big key I think is, is variable speed, is really learning how to use that, the, uh, the pedal for the um, burr at like a gas pedal, right? And, and, and turning it up, turning it down. When you meet some resistance, you kind of turn it up a little bit to kind of get into the area, but then you turn it down to allow it to kind of grind a little bit but you're not necessarily going full speed. If you do happen to get some, some necrosis of the, um, of the skin, it's a relatively, you know, you just have to recognize it. If you, if you don't like that tissue, if it looks unusual or you're unhappy with its appearance, you can just take a 15 blade and just excise that unhealthy skin out and then close it over. I'd much rather do that than have it, you know, become an eschar postoperatively. And again, part of that comes with experience in terms of, I will say that there, there's definitely a, a learning curve associated with that. I, when I first started, I had more, you know, kind of burned edges here and there than I do now because I've learned to use the tool better and I've learned to modulate my speed better to control the thermal generation. Okay, uh, that's, that's great. And I think that advice, if, if you see any thermal necrosis, go ahead and, and resect it and do a, a primary closure at the time rather than leaving it alone and uh because it because it can it can get you on the backside. Right. All right. One simple question, are you comfortable doing bilateral micas? Yeah, I I, I would feel comfortable doing a bilateral mica at this point in time. Um, you know, as long right. as the patient has acts, you know, has adequate resources at home. But no, I think they're they're totally stable and, and I would feel comfortable letting patients do uh you know weight bear fully uh, you know, they're not, again, they're not running laps, but to, to get around the house and do the things they need to do. All right. There, there are a couple of questions about IM angle. How high the IM angle? In addition, a second question is struggling to get the fixation in in a low IM angle. So address both of those. So the high, so right. So the high IM angle, I feel very comfortable with a high IM angle without a doubt. That actually makes it easier to fire your K wires because you're more perpendicular to the first ray. Um, I do think you have to be careful and make sure that you're looking. I, I, I make my judgment about lapidus and, and that on the lateral X-ray of the foot. And I, I, if I see a lot of opening on the plantar aspect of the TMT joint, a lot of, uh, I call sag or gapping, uh, on the plantar aspect of the IM of the uh, TMT joint, I will lean more toward a lapidus type procedure than the than the mica. Um, 
but I, I think that the, the IM angle that's high, that doesn't necessarily have a big plantar gap, you can comfortably and easily, easily do uh, you know, an IM angle of, of anywhere 15, 20 degrees even, uh, you know, with, without a problem. Uh, um, the, and, a, and, a, and a higher hallux valgus angle as well, again, because you're gonna translate that head over. Uh, the low angle, yeah, it, it, it takes some practice to learn how to, if you will, skive that K wire a little bit. Uh, one of the things that I try to do is, um, uh, you know, really try to make sure my hand is, is as close to the foot as possible uh, when I'm putting in that K wire. Uh, I think the other thing to, to be aware of is that you, know, you can, if you need to, you can cheat just a tiny bit distal on where you place that first K wire. Um, and so, you, you know, ideally it'd be perfect to be in the, that metaphyseal area of the flare of the first metatarsal to, to, to put that first mica screw. But if you need to go down just a little bit further, as long as you're getting two cortices, then I've found that, that I can get adequate purchase and, and they still do fine. I've seen uh, on the low IM angle, on the low shifts, yeah. that, that a number of people can only get one screw in that. I think that's probably safe on the low shifts. Yeah, I think especially if you're doing a chevron, you know, if yeah. you're doing the chevron as opposed to a transverse osteotomy, I think that would be fine. But I, I also, you know, the question is, you know, uh, how many of those patients uh, are you are you truly extending that first ray out far enough? And that's part of what I've seen also is is am I am I shifting the head far enough? And uh, and and part of shifting the head far enough is also opening up that that TMT joint and making sure you're at the maximum IM angle for that TMT joint. And so I think that's something to make sure that if you're doing a lot of low angle or 25 to 40% shifts of your metatarsal head, you may want to wonder, you know, you may want to question whether or not you're getting a far enough a pull on that, for, on that proximal first ray to take all the slack out of the first TMT joint so you don't have an increase, you don't have a potential drift of the first TMT joint into residual varus. Understood. All right, here's a, here's a question pretty specific. I have trouble shifting the mat head over, but I was taught to make the cut proximal to medial distal lateral, which is what you described. Right. Um, in essence, lengthens the metatarsal or, or with the shortening, keeps it from shortening. The head also seems to go into valgus with the translation. If the, I make the cut more perpendicular to the second mat, do you think these issues be resolved and what are the risk of doing that? So the risk, I guess, of going to, you know, perpendicular to the second would be shortening the, the first ray, obviously, because you're going to be at an angle that's going to be at an oblique angle that will, will translate the head more proximal. Um, I think that I think the maneuver is, diff, is difficult to master. So you do have to, to work on that triplanar maneuver that we're doing to kind of hold that. And sometimes what I will do actually is get my, you know, after I make my cut, I get my K wire in position, I'll actually penetrate it through the cortex, that second cortex to about two or three millimeters. And then sometimes what I do is I will focus, I will use two hands and I will use one hand to translate. And that the, when you talk about the head going into valgus, a lot of times that's from not pulling the toe back into varus. So what you have to do is you push the head and you translate the head, but then you pull backward with your hand this way. And when you do that, you're gonna pull the, the toe into varus. That takes the head, if you will, out of the valgus alignment. And then you have to hold the up and down translation. And that sometimes becomes difficult. So sometimes what I'll do is use my left hand if it's a, 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 a left hand or a, a left foot. And I'll translate, hold it, and I'm holding the translation and, and the valgus uh, uh, and the toe into varus with my hand this way. And then I use my other hand to, to, to hold the metatarsal dorsal plantar so that I can make sure that stays in the correct alignment. And then I have my assistant fire that first K wire into the head where, because I've already kind of got it set. I know I'm in the position that I want to be. I'm using fluoro to make sure I'm translated over far enough. And my assistant will actually push that K wire into the head. And, and I've found that that sometimes helps me to gain all three 
corrections at the same time if I'm having trouble getting one hand, uh, the one hand maneuver to do it. So uh, I guess the message would be don't get too stuck on just using one hand. If you need to use two hands to, to, to get the maneuvers done, then use two hands and set your, you set your assistant up for success and that all they have to do is push the K-wire through the, the metatarsal head because you've already got it through the two cortices and ready to go. All right, I like that. Uh, best method for irrigating and evacuating out the bone pits, especially when using the grinding down technique. Any problems with wound healing due to bone pits? Uh, uh, so not in mica. I, I, you know, I, I have had an occasional issue here and there with a distal metatarsal metaphyseal osteotomy where I get almost a foreign body reaction from some of the bone, you know, the bone debris in that area, but I've not had that happen in the mica. But what I do is, you know, uh, aggressively push, kind of milk out the, the uh, debris. And then I use a, a catheter tip, like a soft catheter tip from an IV. And I use a 5cc syringe. And then I put the catheter tip into the, the uh, small incision and I flush. And I think the big key is doing that a lot. You know, don't do it once and you're done. Uh, you know, we're kind of used to splashing on a little irrigation on our open incision after we do our osteotomy and, you know, splashing once or twice with the bulb syringe and, and out you go because there's a big hole for it to come out of. So any debris is going to just fall out of the wound. When you've got these percutaneous incisions, you really have to flush and then push, flush and push. And I'll do that five or six times with a 5cc syringe kind of under, you know, a good, a good pressure push when I push it in there. And that kind of breaks it up and, and allows some of that morselized bone to get out of there uh, uh, more freely than it would otherwise. All right, what percentage of these are you doing in Aiken? Uh, I'd probably say 90% of them I'm doing in Aiken. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's my, that's my experience. Me also, it's just, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in the philosophy, if you think about it, Aiken, do it. It's so simple to do. And so many of these patients, uh, so many of them that I've, I take care of, you know, I, I have a hallux interphalangeus. And so, you know, just getting that little bit of that five degree correction or 10 degree correction on that hallux interphalangeus, in my experience, the patient is just happier. Uh, when that toe just curls a little bit inward, even though it's the IP joint where it does, they, they kind of have this, well, you know, the toe's going back in, Dr. Mangone, is everything going to be okay? And so, there's, uh, there's something about the toe being straight that makes it you know, uh, a, a more successful operation. Right. Um, so a question, um, if you don't have an assistant, how do you hold the reduction and fire the K-wire at the same time? And I think you know, one of the things that I've learned is that you have to have that first K-wire ready to go um, across both cortices before you do the shift. So that's the first important thing. The second is if you have a problem holding it, um, using a K-wire in the shaft technique uh, can help you with that. But ultimately, um, it, that's, that the key is, is having the K-wire ready to go. And if you have to use two hands, as Pete was saying, then you have to use two hands. I, I, I have big enough hands where I can pull the dorsal planter and then move it over. But, um, but that, that, the key is having the K wire set up, ready to go prior, prior to. Do you agree with that, Pete? Yes, and I, and I, can, I have done it by myself with, a, with an assistant, you know, not with, an, with, a, with just a scrub. You know? And so again, if I know that my K wire is set up correctly and I, 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 I know where it's gonna go, I you know, get the K-wire, you know, I've made my cut, I now place my K-wire, I know it's in the, the, the center of the metatarsal shaft, I put it through that second cortex, just a couple of millimeters, not all, you know, just enough to kind of make sure that it's gonna track on that line. Then I talk to my scrub and I say, okay, here's the deal, I'm gonna hold this, and when I hold this, you're gonna turn it on and just put it in until I tell you to stop. And, and that person is competent, they can do it, and, uh, and you just hold it there and then they fire. And it's only, they only have to put it in about two centimeters and it's done. And, and then once you get that, then I still kind of try to hold the rotation because I still think until I get my second K wire in, there's still some rotational component. You can kind of lose a little bit of the rotation on one axis point. So I continue to hold the toe, sorry, I'm not a screen here. 
hold the toe, you know, in that, that anti -pro or, or depronated uh, uh, position. And then I can hold that very easily and place my second K wire myself, right? Because now the head is shifted, the correction is there. Now I'm just kind of getting that last little bit of rotation while I put in my second wire. Um, one of the other things is uh, using a, a solid drill to get started. And that's something that we learned with the Jones fracture that you could, with a solid drill, you can get started. You get through the first cortex, you, you get almost to the second cortex, then you can thread in your K-wire and finish it. And Pete showed that by putting a larger K-wire distally, have it all ready, and then once he's got the second, the first screw in, put the smaller wire in, drill over that, and then you're ready to go. So anytime you need to use something just just stiffer and um, and ideally you can ask your rep to have a, a stiffer wire the the wire for the 40 is a 14 and typically I'll have a 20 solid drill that will get you started and get your angle right and then you can slide the 14 wire and finish it I think the um, actual original technique I I, I, I I think one of the original technique tips that Joel and David used to talk about would be to actually use the two millimeter burr and, and it acts just like a drill, you know, just use the two millimeter burr as your starting hole. And like, just like you said, it acts as a solid, a solid drill bit. And essentially you can kind of put it in for a centimeter or so, make sure it's in the correct alignment and in the direction that you want it to go. And then you can put your K wire in that hole and advance it in the direction you want to take it to. Well, I did, I did, put a, um, a note out to one of the questionnaires. Um, in the VLC, the Virtual Learning Center, Wright Medical, if you put in ProStep and go there, um, Joel, uh, David shows that technique uh, using a solid, wire, a solid drill. So if you wanna look at it, it's good to go. Right. Last question, um, do you use the chamfered screws for any other indications? Yes. I use my chain. I, I use them a lot more than I used to. Uh, I use them for my lapidus. I, I do a I do a MIS percutaneous lapidus uh, procedure or a mini open, uh, uh, and I use the uh, construct um, with the the and they're fantastic for that. Rock solid stable. I use them for um, IP joint fusions of the great toe. I've used them for MTP joint fusion, percutaneous MTP joint fusions. So, um, and they have fantastic purchase for that. Um, and I've used them for uh, um, TMT fusions, you know, outside of, outside of the lapidus. Like if I've got a, you know, two, three TMT fusion or, or a, a navicular cuneiform fusion. Uh, and I think I've even used them uh, once or twice in a TN fusion. So they're, you know, uh, they're, they're the, the, the rate, the limiting step on those, of course, is size in terms of width and depth because they only come in 60. I think the longest depth right now is 60. 60. And so, um, so, they, uh, so that you have to know, you know, you gotta make sure your depth is okay there uh, to be able to get all four cortices. But, the, uh, but I have used them in other locations and I found them to be really fantastic screws. They've all right, people, we, purchase. We gotta talk about, uh, about complications. Yes. Uh, have you seen Halix Varus with this technique? I have not seen Halix Varus with this technique. So that's good news. How often do you see recurrence? Becky Serrano's, uh, Becky Serrano, uh, less than 4%, which is pretty good. Um, is that about I have that? had, I've done over 50 of these procedures. I've had two recurrences. One was a patient who had a, a previous bunion that, that actually had a previous bunion procedure and I agreed to do her MIS. And honestly, that was not a good decision. Uh, you know, that old, you know, bad, bad, wrong patient, wrong operation, got a wrong, got not a good result. Uh, and there was just too much scar tissue where she had had previous surgery. And, 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 and it can, I know Joelle has done it. I asked him about it. It can be done. But in my hands at that point in time was probably not the right thing to do uh, and, and could have been done better open. And then the second was the original patient I did. The first patient I did had a metatarsis adductus. And I, I kind of told her that, hey, you know, like any of those metatarsis adductus patients, you know, their IM angle is not huge because the, the, the second metatarsal shaft is also in adductus. 
And so I translated her over probably 50 to 60%. I did everything, and, but she still drifted back. Now she, just like most metatarsus adductus patients, she did not have a bunion because the, 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 the medial contour of her foot was good, but she did have a little bit of a hallux valgus recurrence because of the, the metatarsus adductus, just like any patient. And so that was, again, I, I kind of talked to her about that beforehand and I'm counting it as a recurrence, but I honestly tell most of my patients with that clinical scenario that they can expect their toe to drift back inward a little bit from that surgery. But outside of those, I have not had a recurrence in my patients. Okay, delayed union? I've had uh, one patient that I, it, that I did that, that I got a CT on because she continued to have persistent pain and I thought she uh, did not look healed on the CT. Uh, but she you know, eventually went on to, you know, her, her swelling and soreness and, and everything kind of went away and she did fine. Um, but I really have not seen a, a true non-union you know, non where, where the bone has not healed. Okay. All right, so we're going to do one case just because um, we're kind of running out of time, and I wanted to uh, specifically talk about some of the um, the reasons why this is um, interesting. So here's a forty-one-year-old. Uh, can you can you see and hear me, Peter? Yeah, I can see you, but I can't see your screen. You can't see my screen? No, not yet. Oh, that's I know why because I didn't. Save screen. Yeah, that's good. good. So I'm on top of this. Okay. Um, here we go. There we go. Now I can see it. Beautiful. This may be a better case to do uh, without you seeing the screen. There All right. Go. This is a 41 year old female, severe diabetic neuropathy, and she had a tibio calcaneal fusion four years before um, for an acute charco with uh, DKA and, uh, and uh, an infected ankle. Uh, so I get her fused, which that in itself, as you know, is, is a reason to high five and chest bump. And four years later, she, she's tried to get me to lengthen her and I won't do it. Four years later, she comes in and she goes, I have a new boyfriend. He doesn't like my feet. I go, well, I mean, you're, you've got a Charco foot. And she goes, no, he hates my bunions as do I. So she is neuropathic. Um, she's got her A1C down below six. So she's kind of got her life back together. Uh, the first time I met her, she was in a diabetic coma. And is, is this something with the proper preoperative that this, this might, you might want to give this a try on the MIS more so than in an open procedure. Because I offered her a fusion and she, she did a little research and she told me that that was not a bunion surgery. She does not have arthritis. Right, right. No, I, no, I think this is a patient that definitely it, it opens up the door for this patient who otherwise wouldn't be, or wouldn't be as, as you know, enticing of a candidate. I thought you were gonna get ready to tell me she wanted to get in her high heel shoe as well. Um, but uh, oh, she, she does, she does, but, yeah. but she, uh, she's happy with her, um, with the two inch lift. Right. And she's out of a brace. So she's, in, she's in good shape. But I think this is a patient, you know, obviously part of her bunion issue is, is her, um, hallux interphalangeus. Part of her bunion issue is her, uh, dorsal kind of, you know, elevated first ray. And, and I think this is a patient that can do very well with a, a, a pro-step MIS kind of a dorsal medial bunion, a bunion eminence resection. Not, I wouldn't do a mica in this patient. I wouldn't do a distal chevron, but I think you could do a bunion eminence resection and then do a very aggressive um, Aiken. And this is that patient that we talked about or that technique that I was telling you about where you can uh, you know, essentially dial in your Aiken you know, start with your osteotomy and then just continue to press the toe into a little bit of varus on top of the, the, uh, the burr. And, and by doing that, uh, dial in the correction you want, fire your K-wire across, and now you've got a, your bunion eminence is resected, uh, which is probably more of a dorsal medial bunion in this case. And, you're, and you can actually, you know, 
correct some of the rotation of the phalanx at the same time because you can make your osteotomy probably in this case a little bit more dorsal medial as opposed to straight medial which allows you to then you know leave a plantar lateral hinge and bring up the toe into a a, 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 a corrected position um, in a biplanar manner well so this is my first pro step bunion so oh there you uh, go You're good like, micah congratulations on that i, I plantar flexed her a little bit yeah you did yeah i saw that yeah because she was dorsiflexed and she, and and god bless her she loves this yeah that's awesome um, that's a, i i would have done more of a bunion eminence resection but that looks fantastic and uh, she ended up um she's she's done well she's still trying to get me to lengthen her I may send her to Asheville for that. There you go. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, fifty-six-year-old female, very active banker, kind of, kind of right in our wheelhouse. There are people that we, that we get to know at the uh, country club and gym. Um, is I mean, this to me is the is exactly where I want to be if I'm going to offer pro step. I completely agree. I think this is the. Uh... You know, the, this is a, a slightly cavus foot. It's not a, a you know, a sagging, you know, uh, hypermobile, even though there's some rotational component, hypermobile first ray kind of scenario. This is that patient who I think does fantastic with a, with a micro procedure. Yeah, and she did. Um, and they all seem, by the, they all seem when you have the cavus like that, they do kind of plantar flex. Yeah. Just a slight amount, which, which kind of corrects for their, if you go back to that previous x-ray, you can see there that the, the previous slide, you know, it's kind of a, uh, you know, kind of an elevated first ray a little bit, yeah. you know, and so they, they do somewhat plantar flex and they do fine. And when I first started and I saw that on the x-ray, I was like, they, I would see them back in the office and I was like, oh my gosh, it's plantar flex. They're going to be symptomatic, but actually they're, they're not symptomatic. And I think that's actually where it really needs to be. I agree. All right. So, uh, let me see if there are any new questions. Um, no, I, th I think so. Do, uh, Pete, do you have any other kind of final words as we um, as we we finish up here, and uh, and we can uh, as we, as you're doing that, if anybody has got any final questions, we can also do that. No, I mean I I think I I. Uh... I like to talk about whenever I give my talks about all the kind of the advanced stuff that I've done in my career that, you know, part of the reason I work that way is because Jim Samarco, who was my fellowship director, used to, uh, you know, talk to me and, and we were sitting one day and he said to me, you know, Pete, if, if you're still doing the same thing 10 years from now that I teach you or I taught you how to do, then you're not thinking and you're not trying to work toward making your patients better. And that doesn't mean you're changing for change sake. Certainly there are some things that I do that are quote old fashioned or, or I'm still doing them the same way. And, but at the same time, I'm always looking to try to improve my patient's outcomes, my patient's experience. And I think that you know, we're obligated to do that and we're obligated to try to find the best thing for our patients. And sometimes that makes the surgeon you know, a little uncomfortable to start with. Uh, but I think I would just open your mind to understanding that the, you can have success. You just need to go about it in a systematic manner. And if you think back to when you started your orthopedic residency, you know, the first time you put an intermedullary nail in a tibia or the first time you put a fibula plate on the fibula as a PGY2 or a PGY1, you felt uncomfortable. And it takes time to learn. Don't let that be a deterrent to, to learning. And so, you know, there are plenty of courses that Wright Medical sponsor. Uh, and there's plenty of people like myself and Hodges and others who really feel passionate about this and are excited about teaching people uh, and, and having people learn these techniques which can help advance their patient's care. So, uh, you know, seize the opportunity uh, to, to make your patients better. Well, my final thing will say, these are, these are two, two surgeons who have plenty of business. This is, this is not a marketing scheme for us, though it can be an amazing driver to your practice um and and there are plenty of uh, testimonials to that out there including a number of really good studies to that but um but you know both of us over 20 years in practice and if we wanted to stay with what we're doing we could have i think this is a very unique tool that um you're going to end up looking for things to do and to use it in your practice 